All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Donya Human Rights Center Distinguished Lecture. My name is Kyoteru Tsutsui, and I'm the director of the Donya Human Rights Center. Um, before I introduce our distinguished speaker today, I'd like to start by acknowledging all the co-sponsoring units whose generous contributions made this lecture possible. Uh, those units are Department of Afro-American and African Studies, Department of History, Department of Sociology, Eisenberg Institute for Historical Studies, Institute for the Humanities, King Chavez Park's Visiting Professors Program, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Office of the Provost, and the LSNA Dean's Office. Now, I'm deeply honored and delighted to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Professor Carol Anderson. Professor Anderson is Charles Howard Kandra Professor of African American Studies at Emory University. A historian by training, she has examined issues of race, justice, and inequality in the US with a special focus on how international politics intersect with racial tensions and policies in the US. Her first book, Eyes of the Price, uh -huh. The United Nations and the African American Struggle for Human Rights, 1944 to 1955, is a landmark achievement in human rights historiography that revealed how African-American activists engaged with the United Nations to fight for their human rights in the early post-World War II period, but eventually dropped human rights in favor of civil rights because of the Cold War politics that stigmatized human rights as the agenda of communists and socialists, mm. and therefore unpatriotic. That choice propelled the civil rights movement to success, but doomed the prospect for African Americans' economic and social rights for decades to follow, the consequences of which we continue to witness today. Mm -hmm. The book won many awards and is read widely across the nation and the world. Uh, and it has been a mainstay for my courses on human rights, both at the graduate and undergraduate levels. Her second book, Bourgeois Radicals, the NAACP and the Struggle for Con uh, Colonial Liberation, 1941 to 1960, is another tool force that picks up different strands of the early post-World War II politics, including US foreign policy in the context of the Cold War, uh, human rights diplomacy in the formative years of the United Nations, and NAACP leaders' support for anti-colonialism in Africa and Asia. And Professor Anderson weaves these strands into a compelling narrative that reveals the unknown history, relatively unknown history of African-American activists' engagement with the world and their influence on the struggle for colonial liberation uh, of peoples of color in Africa and Asia, uh, in countries such as Libya, Eritrea, Somalia, um, and Indonesia. With these two historical masterpieces under her belt, she authored her third book, White Rage, The Unspoken Truth About Our Racial Divide, which she will talk about today, which you can, if you haven't uh, purchased this already, uh, it'll be outside after the lecture for book signing. Uh, the book is a New York Times bestseller, uh, has been reviewed and discussed broadly from New York Times and Washington Post to foreign affairs, and won many awards, including the National Book Critics Circle Award. It offers riveting accounts of key historical moments for race relations in the US, from the re Reconstruction era to Obama presidency, chronicling the racial divide that has haunted this country for centuries. With this book, she has firmly established herself as one of the most important scholars in the debate about race in the US today. Armed with facts and historical evidence, she provides an authoritative voice to the national and international conversations about race, justice, equality, and human rights. She engages with many media outlets from New York Times and Washington Post to PBS, CNN, and BBC, and advises various institutions from American Historical Association and Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture to the US State Department and the United Nations. We are privileged to have her with us today uh, to share her historically informed insights and searing critiques about race relations in the US. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Carol Anderson. 
Wow, thank you. Um, this is a Tuesday, right? <laughs> this is an amazing audience on a Tuesday. Thank you so much for being here. I, and to let you know, I'm a walker, but they tell me I can't go past this black tape here. I've always been a rule breaker. <laughs> um, I want to thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you for caring about the, the, the roots of our racial divide in this nation. Because understanding those roots, how we got here, is going to allow us to have the pathway to get out. And so I'm going to start off first by talking about how this black woman got to white rage. <laughs> <laughs> and in some ways, it may look like it was Ferguson, because that's where the Washington Post op-ed emerged out of, was the uprising in Ferguson. But actually, it began before then. It was February 1999, and a black man was coming home from a long, hard day's work. He got home. God, and there was no food. You know that moment where you've been working hard all day and you're hungry and there's no food? And you're like, mm, hungry. And so he decided, I'm going to go get some food. I mean, it's kind of like, I got some sociologists in here. So we get Maslow's basic hierarchy of needs in this place, right? <laughs> you know, I'm hungry. I want to eat. And so he left his apartment to go get some food. When he stepped out, all of a sudden, four officers from the New York Police Department pulled up, hopped out of their car, guns drawn, and they started firing. 41 bullets later, Amadou Diallo went down. 19 of those bullets hit him. Amadou was unarmed. Amadou had done nothing but be black in New York City. That was Amadou's crime. I'm outraged. Many were outraged. But my outrage turned to something else. When I saw Rudy Giuliani on Ted Koppel's Nightline, and Ted Koppel is one of those hardcore interviewers. He doesn't give softball interviews. So Ted Koppel is on him. Amadou, Amadou, Amadou. And Rudy's smug. Y'all seen Rudy? Rudy. And Rudy's like, my policies are working. New York City is safer than it has ever been. It is safe in New York City because of my policies. Safe. And I'm like, safe for who? It's not safe for Amadou, because Amadou went down. But Rudy barely mentioned Amadou's name. And as he talked about his policies, the policy that he was talking about was broken windows policing. That broken windows policing that then had the police force just hyper-policing an area. Uh, you, you littered, boom, the cops were on you. You jaywalked, boom, the cops were on you. You stood while being black, boom, the cops were on you. Hyper-policing criminalized black and brown neighborhoods in New York City. That's the policy that Rudy Giuliani said was making New York City safer. And he had his flip chart that showed crime going down to prove the safety of New York City. And so I'm sitting there as he continues to talk about my police force is the best behaved and the most restrained in America. And I'm having one of those kind of Kafka-esque moments where you know somebody has said something, but it's not matching up. He's like, Grr, Gregor Samsa is OK, but he looks like a big cockroach. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so because I'm thinking best behave and most restrained, don't fire 41 bullets at an unarmed man. I don't know. But I don't know what to call this thing that I'm witnessing with Rudy Giuliani. Because there was an air of authority and legitimacy, an air of reasonableness, while everything that he's describing is absolutely illegitimate and unreasonable. But I don't know what to call it. 
So as a scholar, I keep researching, I keep writing. I keep reading and writing and talking and researching and reading and writing and you know, this is what we do. And August 2014, I'm at my home computer in my home office and I got the little TV on, actually it's a little big TV, and I'm watching and all of a sudden Ferguson is on fire. The flames seem to be everywhere. And as I'm flipping the channel, you know how you're flipping the channels, and, and I'm seeing the flames, the flames, the flames, the flames. And what began to strike me was it didn't matter whether, okay, my left hand, whether I was listening to MSNBC, kind of left, CNN, or Fox. <laughs> It really didn't matter. They were all saying the same thing. Ooh, look at that black rage. Look at black folks burning up where they live. What is wrong with black people burning up where they live? Did you see black people burning up where they live? Look at that. Black people burning up where they live. And as they were describing this black rage, I'm sitting there shaking my head. No, that's white rage. Ooh, that's white rage. I had lived in Missouri for 13 years. I taught at the University of Missouri. I saw that the way that those policies worked to undermine citizenship, to undermine African Americans' access to their rights. And, I, and as I looked at this, I said, we have been so focused as a nation on the flames that we've missed the kindling. Kindling. In Ferguson, Missouri, 67% of the population is African American. In the 2013 municipal election, the black voter turnout rate was 6%. How do you turn 67% percent into six percent. Those are Jim Crow figures. Those are the figures that you're looking at in Alabama in 1950. And we're talking 2013. How does that happen? Policies. Policies. Or let's talk about education, the school system. Michael Brown school system. The way that Missouri works, Missouri um, rates its schools on a scale that where you can get 140 points. And 140 points, this is how they accredit their schools. Graduation rates, standardized test scores, matriculation rates, you know, all of those things, and you get points for them, 140. How many points do you think Michael Brown's school system received? Two, whoo, cynical. <laughs> Dang! <laughs> okay, we're not quite Mississippi. <laughs> we, we got a two over here. Do I hear another one? Ten. ten. Who said ten? Mm, ten. Ten out of 140 points for 15 years. Think about that. We have had an entire generation of black children from kindergarten through the 12th grade coming through a school system that can garner no more than 10 points. And policymakers are cool with this. Haven't done Jack Diddley to solve this. Jack Diddley is the technical term, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and because it's 15 years, not only have we had an entire generation coming through, but we're sending another generation through in a school system that does not function. Kindling. Kindling. The police force. We know that the police are here to 
that's it. <laughs> Except, see, up in Michigan, it's serve and protect. Back in the rest of the world, it's protect and serve. <laughs> but yeah, they are here to serve and protect. Protect and serve. It sounds so good. No. In Ferguson, the police force looked at that black community as prey to extract resources out of that working class community to fund city services. Here's how it worked. Looks like you were doing 26 and a 25 ticket. Mm, I didn't see you put that blinker on. Ticket. That didn't look like a full stop. Ticket. Now, after a while of getting these $50 tickets, if you're working class, you don't have that kind of money. Because when you begin to think about that $50 could be your light bill. That $50 could be paying for daycare. So extracting $50, you, you, you don't have it. But not paying that ticket, then all of a sudden, you've got a warrant out for your arrest. So the next time you're doing 26 and a 25, you're going to jail. And then you have all of the court costs that come with hitting the criminal justice system full force. In Ferguson, those tickets and those court costs and those fees generated 25% of the city's operating revenue. And just so we're clear about justice being blind, the way that it worked is if a white person happened to be stopped and received a ticket, when the cops saw there was somebody white going, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> no, you can go ahead. Or if the cop didn't know the rules and that white person then went to go pay the ticket, there was this kind of stunned look that there was a white person there paying the ticket. Oh, no, you don't have to pay this ticket, and the ticket would get ripped up. So these fees are being extracted from a black working class community, kindling. And so as I began to think through how this thing worked, it became very clear to me that white rage is not about visible violence. White rage works smoothly, subtly, corrosively through the legislature, through the school board, through the judiciary, through zoning boards. White rage works through our legislature. It works through the White House. What I also began to understand about white rage is that it wasn't the presence of black people that was the trigger. I think I just heard Scooby-Doo right there. Huh? <laughs> it's the presence of black people who achieve. It's the presence of black people who aspire. It's the presence of black people who refuse to accept subjugation. The presence of black people who demand their civil rights. That almost sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? Because part of what we know about America, we know these narratives. In America, you can have the American dream. All you have to do is work hard. Work hard. Yes. <laughs> she said, like, I've heard this a thousand times. All you have to do is work hard. Go to school. Go to school. Uh, it, you know, work hard, go to school, follow the rules, and you too can have the American dream. But when African Americans work hard, go to school, do what they're supposed to do, the response has been white rage. And it's like, what? So how do you explain then, for instance, education? America needs the narrative of black pathology in order to make this stuff sound logical. 
How many have heard? Well, the problem with our schools is that black kids really don't value education. Come on, you know you've heard it. She's like, okay, I may have heard it. Okay, I, I kind of sort of heard it. <laughs> and you know, and black parents don't value education either. You know, they're not sitting there with their kids reading to them at night. So if black parents don't value education and black kids don't value education, how are we supposed to fix these schools? We've heard this. Or we've heard in the 2016 election, <laughs> Ooh, I had one of those moments. <laughs> in, in the aftermath of that election, one of the first kinds of reports I saw coming out was that, you know, black people didn't show up at the polls. You know, they stayed, well, you know, they just weren't feeling Hillary. Who heard that? Oh, yeah, see, <laughs> they just weren't feeling Hillary. And so they did not show up. I mean, what are you supposed to do? We have the polls. We tell them there's an election. They don't want to vote. There's, there's nothing you can do. Or we've heard it's really not about mass incarceration. It's about, you know, black folks just need to quit committing crimes. How many times have we heard that? Okay. This is the narrative of black pathology. It is powerful. It is embedded. It works its way through our public policies. But it's a falsehood. I'm going to give you one quick falsehood, and then I'll move into the rest of the, the, the lecture. How many times have we heard? I keep saying that, but you know, this, this, how many times? <laughs> you know, the problem with the black community is that black men will not take care of their kids. <laughs> Oh, and there's a brother up there going, I heard this 8 billion 795 times, and I'm sick of it, right? Yeah, I, I feel you, I feel you. Okay, so the CDC did a study, and they found that African American men spend more quality time with their children than men of any other race or ethnicity. Quality time, reading to them doing homework with them, not just plopping them down in front of a TV, but quality time than anybody else. Uh. <laughs> and that is regardless of the relationship with the mother. Wow. So everybody can point to the one anecdote. But when you start looking in the aggregate, it's telling a very different story. But if we have public policies that are all about trifling, I use that word, trifling black men, then we have set up a policy that has absolutely nothing to do with the reality that is on the ground. So let's take education. Because we have heard that black folks don't value education. But how do you explain how government after government after government has worked overtime to deny black children access to quality education. Let's take the case in 1947 in Prince Edward County, Virginia. This would be after the US defeated the, helped defeat the Nazis. I just need to do that historical time frame so we get where we are. They finally built a black high school in Prince Edward County, Virginia, finally. A little bitty thing. Within a few years, the place is overflowing. I mean, you've got kids, it's, it's holding somewhere between two and a half to three times as many students as it was built to hold. And so black parents and black students are going to the all white school board saying, look, this is, this is an untenable um, condition for our children to learn in. We need to have a bigger school. And the school board said, no. And they were like, no, we need to have a bigger school. And finally, the parents are pushing so hard that the school board relents and puts up three tar paper shacks and tells the black kids that they can go learn there. Barbara John, 17, she's an organizer. She started talking to her classmates. You believe this mess? That's some tar paper shack. 
not sitting in some tar paper shack. Because I know what the kids, the white kids have at their schools. They got bricks. And they've got real furnaces. We got this man. After the defeat of the Nazis? Not today. And she organized a massive walkout. You know, so the room looked like this, right? And then all of a sudden, the students just got up. <laughs> and the teachers and the administrators were like, what is this? <laughs> they go, whoa, yes. We demand our rights. Death threats started raining down on Barbara Johns, a 17-year-old, for demanding to be educated. They had, her parents had to spirit her away from Virginia to safety in Alabama. <laughs> this is where I'm like, Lord, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> you know, when you got to go to Alabama for safety, you know how bad it is. <laughs> and again, this is 1951 by this time. 1951 Alabama, as a black person, you're going to be safe. But that is what Barbara Johns was under because she demanded the right to be educated. That Prince Edward County school became part, school system became part, bundled into the, the larger Brown case. It was one of the cases in the big Brown decision because it was so egregious, so showing the disparities in education, access to quality education. So after Brown, what Prince Edward County figured out it was going to do in order to have an equal school system was to shut down the entire public school system. You're like, what the I, I love that because the, 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 the little MTV pop-up video bubbles, and stuff, they just shut down the entire public school system. Yes, they did. And because the rationale was, if we have to have an equal school system, public school system, then there's not a public school system for whites and there's not a public school system for blacks. Therefore, it's equal. And there's that kind of I R smart somewhere written in there, right? <laughs> Except, but you know white parents aren't having that. What do, you, what, what do you mean there's not a school system for my baby? My baby girl's gonna get an edge. My, ba my baby boy's gonna get educated. And they're like, no, 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 don't worry. We got you, we got you. And so what they did then is to take taxpayer-funded dollars. And remember, black people are paying taxes to provide tuition vouchers for white students to go to all white segregated private academies. So if you look at the rise of private schools in the South, you'll start seeing that they, they emerge with incredible frequency after Brown. And these schools emerged with the support of taxpayer dollars to ensure that white children are educated. Now, when they shut down the public school system in Prince Edward County, it was shut down for five years. That means that if you were in the fifth grade when they shut down your school system, it didn't open up again until you were in the 10th. Begin to think about, begin to think about everything you have lost in terms of education. And this is also at the moment where the American economy is beginning its shift, its turn from a manufacturing-based economy to a knowledge-based and technology-driven economy where you absolutely had to have a quality education in order to be able to even have a rat's tail worth of a chance. And we have, as the 101 congressmen and senators signed, the US senators signed off, massive resistance in the South, saying they will do everything in their power to resist the Supreme Court decision. They were not going to provide equal quality schools. They were not going to provide quality education for black children. And then there's this moment, because I was like, surely there has to be something 
that can breach this divide. There has to be some moment where they're like, whoo, 1957. All of a sudden, radio signals pick up this sound. Beep, beep, beep. You know what I'm talking about. And Eisenhower, President Eisenhower is going, dang, 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 because that beep is Sputnik. That beep means that the Soviet's nuclear arsenal that the US was comfortable with saying, yeah, they've got it, but they don't have the technology to get those missiles over the oceans. The Atlantic and the Pacific keep us safe. Beep. <laughs> Beep. <laughs> I mean, anybody ever see Fred Sanford? Sanford and Son? That moment where, Lisbeth! That was happening in the White House. <laughs> And so the Fed decide to do something they have never really done before, and that is to pump hundreds of millions of dollars into public education with the National Defense Education Act. They said, we have got to create the brain power for, to fight the Cold War. We have got to train enough scientists and engineers to ensure that the US has the techno technological heft to be able to match and surpass whatever the Soviets bring. Because this looks like a national security crisis to me. Beep, <laughs> beep. So as this bill is going through Congress, the Alabama congressman and the Alabama senator were the ones shepherding the bills through. OK, spoiler alert. They love the money. They wanted to have assurances from the federal government that they would not have to get rid of their whites-only admissions policies, that they could be in violation of the law of the land, they could be in violation of the Brown decision, and still access federal dollars. The federal government said, cool, no problem. No problem at all. Anybody ever see Hidden Figures? I mean, it's so good. <laughs> so good. But could you imagine in that moment if we had decided to educate all of our folks what this nation could look like, what this nation could be like? But in that critical moment, the policy said, Oh, they got the Brown decision. We are going to use every policy weapon at our command to undermine it. And they did. Education. Or let's take the war on drugs. Let's take it. One of the ways that white rage works is by using the language of reasonableness. We have to keep our community safe. We have to protect our children from this scourge of drugs. These are criminals. The US spent about $1 trillion on the war on drugs. That's with a T. But in fighting the war on drugs, what it did, and the data are really clear on this, African Americans used some drugs at about equal rates to whites. And that drug would probably be marijuana. And they used cocaine less. So we have incarcerated most the group that uses drugs the least to fight the war on drugs. I mean, Kafka's having a field day right now. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
the incarceration rate for African Americans is staggering. Staggering. We have destabilized black communities by ripping mothers and fathers and brothers and uncles out for years on end. We have destabilized state budgets. Think about, I remember this in Ohio, watching the money pour out of the higher education budget and go into the corrections budget. So as we're trying to figure out how to make tuition affordable, how to increase access to higher education by increasing state subsidy so that tuition, the tuition charged to students could be less, instead what we got was this massive shift of state funding out of higher education and into corrections. It costs more to house an inmate in California for a year than it does to pay for a year at Berkeley. This isn't a resource issue. This is a priorities issue. And you're like, but why would we do this? Why would we destabilize communities? Why would we destroy state budgets? Why would we not invest in our people? Why would we not make college affordable, particularly when we're seeing this, this, this gauntlet coming down saying, oh, this is even a more technology-driven economy. This is, we've really got to have an education. Why are we not doing this? The war on drugs was officially launched in the early 1970s under Richard Nixon and gained enormous steam under Ronald Reagan. In 1964, there was the Civil Rights Act. In 1965, there was the Voting Rights Act. Those with felony convictions lose um, many of their rights under both of those acts. So those incredible gains of the Civil Rights Movement the Civil Rights Act basically says, thou shalt not discriminate. Wow. Wow. And, and watching what happens with housing, that is huge. Watching what happens with employment, that is huge. Thou shalt not discriminate. Hmm. And then there's the Voting Rights Act. Well, those with felony convictions, aren't eligible for student, federal student financial aid. So for many, college is out of the question. They're not eligible to live in lots of housing if you have a felony conviction. So all of that thing about thou shalt not discriminate goes away when you've got felony on you. And when it comes to the right to vote, massive felony disfranchisement. In Florida, for instance, almost 25% of, of black adults cannot vote in Florida because of a felony conviction. 25%. It's something like 40% of all black males, something like 18 to 20%, somewhere in there, of black women. But the average for African Americans is about 25%. Now, begin to think about what this means in our national elections. Florida is a huge electoral college state. Florida is able to count for its representatives and for the electoral college, its citizens, its population. But it does not have to have 25% of that population voting. It's like the three-fifth rule in the Constitution, where the slaveholding South got to count the population, but that population did not have rights. That's where we are right now in 2018 in Florida. There is a ballot initiative going through so that felons can get their rights back but that's on the ballot in 2018. That's where we are. 
Speaking of voting, in 2008, Barack Obama won an election that folks were like, or they were like, <laughs> those who were like, <laughs> they were horrified particularly what was so horrific was that using that kind of community organizing skills that he had, they had a massive voter registration voter turnout drive. In his election, 15 million new voters came to the polls in that election. 15 million. Now, what we generally say is that we love democracy. She sneered. I'm just letting y'all know, she sneered. <laughs> we love democracy. <laughs> she scoffed. <laughs> and what we should be embracing is that when you bring 15 million new people to the polls, it's saying 15 million Americans believe they have a stake in this government that they are not alienated, that they see some value in participating. And the composition of that 15 million, 2 million new African Americans voting in 2008. Ooh. 2 million new Latinos voting in 2008. Six 100,000 new Asian Americans voting in 2008. This is that kind of, oh, it gets better. You're like, it gets better? Yes. Almost doubling the number or the percentage of people who made less than $15,000 a year. These are poor folk. So you have blacks, Latinos, Asians and the poor coming to the polls in 2008 because they see something valuable in America. We should be embracing this. This is part of our national narrative about democracy. But instead, what happened was massive voter suppression. These laws targeted those very groups that Obama brought to the polls in 2008. This is how voter suppression works. Again, remember, it sounds innocuous. We have rampant voter fraud. How many have heard that? <laughs> we have got to protect the integrity of the ballot box. Let's talk about how this stuff works. OK, so first let's deal with voter fraud. Let's get this out of the way. Justin Levitt, a law professor um, in California, did a study from 2000 to 2015, 14, 15. I'm really bad with dates. I'm a historian bad with dates. <laughs> and what he found, he went looking for this voter, voter identification fraud. You know the one where you need the voter ID in order to vote? Because that, that's And he found 31 cases out of 1 billion votes. Rampant? Let's talk about, first I'm going to do Texas, and then I'll do Alabama. Texas. Texas waited two hours after the Supreme Court, John Roberts and Clarence Thomas, gutted the Voting Rights Act with the Shelby County v. Holder decision. John Roberts' opinion basically said that uh, the Voting Rights Act was basically an artifact of the past. Racism really no longer existed that way in America. There was no need for this. And this was just the federal, ooh, that look was 
<laughs> and the federal government was just picking on the South. OK. Couple of things. Through the life of the Voting Rights Act, the Department of Justice, because the way that it worked was the Department of Justice or those entities that were under the domain of the Voting Rights Act, any change that they were making to their voting law had to be pre-cleared through the Department of Justice. And you got under the domain of the Voting Rights Act because you had acted a fool. That is the legal term. <laughs> It means that less than 50% of your population was registered to vote and that you had a device like a literacy test or a poll tax that you were using to suppress that vote. You had those two ponies working, you came under the domain of the Voting Rights Act. Under the Voting Rights Act, the Department of Justice had to turn back 700 changes that the states wanted to make to their voting laws. I'm thinking racism may not be over. And the Voting Rights Act had a bailout clause in it. The bailout clause said, don't act a fool. If you don't discriminate in voting for your population for, say, five years, five years, then we don't have to look at you again because you figured it out. All you have to do is not discriminate. So the fact that Georgia was under the Voting Rights Act in 1965 and remained under the Voting Rights Act in 2013, I'm thinking mm, Georgia's trying to discriminate, hasn't quite figured it out. It also had a bail-in clause. The bail-in clause said, OK, you may not have been under the original act, but if we begin to see the kind of discrimination, racial discrimination and linguistic discrimination against your population, we're coming for you. Areas in California, Connecticut, New York, Arizona were bailed in because they were discriminating against their population. This is not a static Voting Rights Act. This thing is necessary. So two hours after it was gutted, Texas passed SB 14. SB 14 was your voter ID law. The voter ID law, because they had rampant voter fraud. We'll get to that. <laughs> said, you have to have certain types of ID. See, that's part of the way that this looks really mythical, because you say, well, you know, you need an ID to, to check out a book from a library. How hard is it? And they don't count your library card. There are only certain types. So it had to be a government-issued photo ID. Ooh, OK. Then it couldn't be your student ID, even though you were at a public university. So your UT Austin ID did not count. But your gun registration. Yeah, you're seeing it. Then, so, but the holy grail for ID is the driver's license. Only one third of the counties in Texas have a Department of Motor Vehicles. Texas calculated that many over a million of its citizens would have to drive 120 miles, 25 miles to the nearest Department of Motor Vehicles to get an ID. So that would be 250 miles round trip. Now, in the original bill, they had a line in there to reimburse people who had to go, had to, had to make that trip. Before the bill passed, they drew a line through it. Now. If you have to make a 250 mile round trip, you can't drive because you don't have a driver's license. It's a little thing, but it's a big thing. How are you going to get there? No, there's no public transportation. I heard some of you thinking, mm, not available. How are you going to get there? This is how this works. It looks legitimate on its surface. 
And then you begin to pull back the layers and you begin to see how systemic inequality is built and steeped in these laws and reaffirmed in these laws. When Texas, the ACLU and the NAACP and the LDF took Texas to court many times, um, in one of those cases, um, Greg Abbott, who's now the governor, he was the attorney general then, is pounding on, we've got rampant voter fraud, we've got rampant voter fraud. And judge, the judge said, okay, rampant, show me. Show me rampant voter fraud. He said, it's rampant. And she's like, no, 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 show me. Yes, it is like oh, rampant. She said, show me. <laughs> Ooh, it's almost like the judge talking to Chris Kobach right now, right? Show me. And so finally, he had two cases. I'm like, is that rampant? <laughs> Let's take Alabama. <clears throat> so in Alabama, Alabama required a vote. Actually, Alabama passed its voter ID law before Shelby, two years before Shelby County v. Holder. Republicans were on tape talking. And they said, we have got to figure out how to depress the black voter turnout. Because you know these aborigines and these illiterates will hop on these HUD finance buses to the polls. So I'm kind of thinking we've got some discriminatory intent in there. So they knew that that thing could not get through a DOJ preclearance. So they just sat on it. But, but a day after Shelby County v. Holder, the, the law went into, um, into action. Now, the way that that one worked, Alabama is a poor state. You may not know this. <laughs> Alabama is poor. It's ranked 47th in the nation in terms of poverty. Yes, 48th. Ooh. They're definitely going, we're number one. It's like 47, 48. I mean, this is, and, and in the Black Belt counties, it is deep systemic poverty, where the Black Belt counties have and at, at the floor is a 25% poverty rate. It's up to a 40% poverty rate in some of the Black Belt counties. There are thousands of people, tens of thousands of people in public housing because of that poverty in Alabama. Alabama made sure that it did not have public housing ID as a viable ID in order to vote. 71% of those in public housing in Alabama are African Americans. If you rule out the sole government issued, because I don't think it gets more government issued than public housing. So when you rule out public housing ID, you have begun to rule out access to the ballot box for poor folk and black folk. Then what Alabama did, you got to love, and this emerged out of pillow talk between the governor and his mistress. You can't make this stuff up. She said, baby, I think you need to close those departments of motor vehicles in the Black Bell County. Ooh, baby, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and he, sh I mean, that's some crazy pillow talk. I mean, of all the stuff y'all could be talking about when you're having an affair, really? Um, <laughs> <laughs> And he shut down the Department of Motor Vehicles in the Black Belt counties. So if you can't use your public housing ID and you don't have a Department of Motor Vehicles in your county, and the disparities between access to private vehicles between blacks and whites, 4% um, of whites do not have a access to a private vehicle. Almost 15% of African Americans do not. So you are skewing mightily access to the polls. But it was cast and we have to, we have budget constraints and this be, is being fiscally responsible. These entities aren't really generating a lot of, of traffic through, so we can't keep them open. White rage sounds reasonable. And so what I set out to do was to, as I say, blow graphite 
onto the fingerprint of white rage and track it historically. From Reconstruction, that moment after the Civil War where black people are no longer property, wow. But human beings, ooh. And then after the past, citizens, whoa. And watching the incredible backlash to undermine the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and the, the acts, like the force acts, coming through to undermine African Americans' access to their citizenship rights, to the Great Migration. This is the moment where Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote that beautiful book, The Warmth of Other Suns, talks about this was the first step that the servant class ever took without asking. Mm. And so that movement out of the South, where, and the South is like, we don't want you, but you can't leave. <laughs> and places like Jacksonville passed a law that African Americans could not leave the city to, for better employment. I'm going to let that hang there for a minute and think about what that looks like in a capitalist economy where, we, where the ability to move for a better job is almost written into our DNA. You cannot move. We will jail you if you move for a better job. And then we will auction your labor off to Brown, to the Civil Rights Movement, and the election of Barack Obama. How are we doing for time? Is that OK? I, hmm? Five away, OK. So what I want to do is read a couple of passages from White Rage and then open it up for Q&A. Okay. And now i got to get my glasses on. One time, I did this without my glasses. Words were swimming on the page. I almost did a Stevie Wonder. I'm too high. <laughs> Speaking of too high, so this first one is on the war on drugs. And after doing uh, a brief outline of Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, where she's looking at these key Supreme Court cases that embed racism into the operational code of the criminal justice system and the war on drugs. Then I move into, taken together, those rulings allowed, indeed encouraged, the criminal justice system to run racially amok. And that's exactly what happened on July 23, 1999, in Tulia, Texas. In the dead of night, local police launched a massive raid and busted a major cocaine trafficking ring. At least that's how it was billed by the media, which, after having been tipped off, lined up to get the best, most humiliating photographs of 46 of the town's 5,000 residents handcuffed in pajamas, underwear, and uncombed bed hair being paraded into the jail for booking. The local newspaper, the Tulia Sentinel, ran the headline, Tulia Streets Cleared of Garbage. The editorial praised law enforcement for ridding Tulia of drug-dealing scumbags. The raid was the result of an 18-month investigation by a man who would be named by Texas's Attorney General as Outstanding Lawman of the Year. Tom Coleman didn't lead a team of investigators. Instead, he single-handedly identified each member of this massive cocaine operation and made more than 100 undercover drug purchases. He was hailed as a hero, and his testimony immediately led to 38 of the 46 being convicted, with the other cases just waiting to get into the clogged court system. Joe Moore, a pig farmer, was sentenced to 99 years for selling $200 worth of cocaine. Kizzy White received 25 years, while her husband, William Cash Love, landed 434 years for possessing an ounce of cocaine. The case began to unravel, however, when Kizzy's sister, Tanya, went to trial. Coleman swore that she had sold him drugs. Tanya, however, had video proof 
that she was at a bank in Oklahoma City, 300 miles away, cashing a check at the very moment he claimed to have bought cocaine from her. Then another defendant, Billy Don Wafer, had timesheets and his boss's eyewitness testimony that Wafer was at work and not out selling drugs to Coleman. And when the outstanding lawman of the year swore under oath that he had purchased cocaine from Yule Bryant, a tall, bushy-haired man, only to have Bryant, bald and five foot six, <laughs> appear in court, it finally became very clear that something was awry. Coleman, in fact, had no proof whatsoever that any of the alleged drug deals had taken place. There were no audio tapes, no photographs, no witnesses, no other police officers present, no fingerprints but his on the bags of drugs, no records. Over the span of an 18 month investigation, he never wore a wire. Now, he claimed to have written each drug transaction on his leg. but to have washed away the evidence when he showered. Okay, I'm gonna stop for a minute right there. Because we have two bad things happening here. Three, but I'm gonna deal with the two in that moment. So either the man has not showered in 18 months, <laughs> or he went out, bought some drugs, wrote it down on his leg, went home, showered. Oh. Then went out, bought some drugs, wrote it down on his leg, went home, showered. Uh, then went for 18 months. Either way, <laughs> right? This is where the story loses plausibility. <laughs> Additional investigation led to no corroborating proof of his allegations. When the police searched and arrested those 46 people and vigorously searched their homes and possessions, no drugs were found nor were weapons, money, paraphernalia, or any other indications at all that the housewife, pig farmer, or anyone else arrested were actually drug kingpins. What was discovered, however, was judicial misconduct running rampant in the war on drugs in Tulia, Texas, with a clear racial bias. Coleman had accused 10% of Tulia's black population of dealing in cocaine Based on his word alone, 50% of all of the black men in town were indicted, convicted, and sentenced to prison. Randy Credico of the William Mosley's Kunstler Fund called Tulia a mass lynching. Taking down 50% of the male adult black population like that, it's outrageous. It's like being accused of raping someone in Indiana in the 1930s. You didn't do it, but it doesn't matter because a bunch of Klansmen on the jury are gonna string you up anyway. But this wasn't 1930. It was the beginning of the 21st century and a powerful civil rights movement had bridged those two eras. And then the last section deals with how to unelect a black president <clears throat> and black respectability. Black respectability or appropriate behavior doesn't seem to matter. If anything, black achievement, black aspirations, and black success are construed as direct threats. Obama's presidency made that clear. Aspirations and their achievement provide no protection, not even to the God-fearing. On June 17, 2015, South Carolinian Dylan Roof, a white, unemployed, 21-year-old high school dropout, was on a mission to take his country back. Ever since George Zimmerman had walked out of the courthouse a free man after killing Trayvon Martin, and a racially polarized nation debated the verdict, Roof had looked to understand the history of America. Trolling through the internet, he stumbled across the Council of Conservative Citizens, the Tri-C, 
the progeny of the 1950s White Citizens Council that had terrorized black people, closed schools, and worked hand in hand with state governments to defy federal civil rights law. But despite the group's avowed racist belief system, in the mid to late 1990s, as the Southern Poverty Law Center reported, the group boasted of having 34 members who were in the Mississippi legislature and had powerful Republican Party allies, including then Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott of Mississippi. By 2004, Mississippi Governor Haley Barber, the chair of the Republican National Committee, and 37 other powerful politicians had all attended Tri-C events in the 21st century. Earl Holt III, chairman of the Tri-C, gave $65,000 to Republican campaign funds in recent years, including donations to the 2016 presidential campaigns of Rand Paul, Rick Santorum, and Ted Cruz. The Tri-C then enjoyed precisely the cachet of respectability that racism requires to achieve its own goals in America. And its website of hatred and lies provided the self-serving education Dylan Roof so desperately craved. He drank in the poison of its message, got into his car, drove to Charleston, entered Emanuel AME, and landed in a Bible study with a group of African Americans who were the very model of respectability. Ruth prayed with them, read the Bible with them, thought they were so nice. Lord. Then he shot them dead. Leaving just one woman alive so that she could, he, she could tell the world what he had done and why. You're taking over our country, he said, and he knew this to be true. Not even a full month after Dylan Roof gunned down nine African Americans at Emanuel AME, Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump fired up his silent majority audience of thousands in July 2015 with a macabre promise. Don't worry, we'll take our country back. No, it is time that we take our country forward into the future, a better future. Thank you. I'm actually going to be at Columbia, and I'm teaching this semester too, so this is getting real interesting. My students are like, yo, gee. <laughs> um, um, I'm going to be at Columbia. I'm going to be talking on my new book um, there um, Thursday and Friday. I'm meeting with graduate students on Friday and giving the talk on Thursday. And the new book is called One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy. So. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, I, I, I had stepped into some mess on Abraham Lincoln in this book. I mean, I had a woman coming after me. I called Abraham Lincoln society. <laughs> well, um, you know, there have been so many biographies of Lincoln, and I know um, uh, his role in the colonization movement um, is something that a lot of people aren't aware of. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I know Eric Foner goes into some detail about this uh, in his book, but even in that book, he gives the impression and, and it was the fire, and for some reason my age is, what's, what's the title of his book? The, um, Reconstruction? The Foner's and Lincoln. Help me out here. <laughs> okay, no, okay, right, anyway, right. Um, uh, he gives the, his opinion was that Lincoln actually had a bit of a come to Jesus and a metamorphosis as the war wore on. Um, I, I wonder what you think about that. <laughs> you know, I, and, and I think we, and I met with some fabulous undergrads from Michigan today. I, we, we could have stayed there and talked all day. It was so fabulous. And, and one of the questions I got dealt with heroes. 
you know, we have our heroes, right? There are those that we just look up to and they, you know, in the midst of, of, of hell, there they are with their kind of kind of courage and that kind of determination. And we're like, Whoa! and But folks are folks. And when we write heroes that just erases their, their, their foibles, their, the, the mistakes that they made, um, then we have so destroyed how history is actually made. And so when I look at Lincoln, I, I do, I see a man who was coming up under an enormous pressure. But Lincoln wasn't about ending slavery. It was a, he was about preserving the Union. Um, and if he could have preserved the Union without having slavery spread west, that would have been fine. But the South threw down the gauntlet. The South was like, no, we need this virus to spread from here to eternity. And he's like, no, we can do here, but not eternity. And so Lincoln was in this bind. When the war, and, and part of the way you see it is that the, emancipa the war started 1861. Look at that a historian getting that date right. Don't ask me the, the month. <laughs> The Emancipation Proclamation isn't until 1863. <laughs> yeah. Right? And so part of what is going on, and this is where being a diplomatic historian comes in, is that I started seeing the Confederacy make, you know, because the Confederacy looked up and said, whoo, you know the North is kind of big. North can really whoop our tail. If the North gets his act together and McClellan stops drilling those folks but actually starts fighting, we're going to be in a heap of trouble. And so they started trying to get the British and the French to hop in the war. They started early trying to get the British and French to hop in the war. And they were telling the French, look, you know what? You can get Mexico. You come in from Mexico. You come in from this side. British, you come in from this side. We, and we're coming in from this. We got them. We got them because this is the big, bad North picking on little old us, right? Now, the South wasn't talking about that we love slavery. They were, they were spinning a very different narrative about a very aggressive North picking on a smaller, smaller unit and that this was the South just defending itself. And that narrative was beginning to have sway. By the, toward the end of 1862, the British and the French are like, OK, this, this, the way this war is going and the, the, the US Army is messing with our, our ships, and so we might have to hop in this thing. And Lincoln is like, oh, crap. You know, because the last thing you want is to fight a civil war and then have the British coming in from this side and the French coming in from this side. But what he knew was that the British really didn't want to fight for slavery. Remember, the British had passed an act in the early 1800s banning the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade. And so that is a major part of the genesis for the Emancipation Proclamation. Because what the Emancipation Proclamation does is says, oh, this is a war about slavery. Ah, oh, so then it makes it politically harder for the British to hop in the war. And the French aren't going to hop in unless the British hop in. So it was a diplomatic way to short circuit what was happening that way. And when you read through the Emancipation Proclamation, because this sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, when we were t kids on the playground, we said, Lincoln freed the slaves. Well, no, so <laughs> because the way that the Emancipation Proclamation reads is that those who are enslaved under the areas controlled by the Confederacy are free. Those who are enslaved under the areas controlled by the Union are still enslaved. So what, you freeing folks that you have absolutely no domain and control over? Wow. Wow. So what, <laughs> so what the Emancipation Proclamation really, this is a beautiful PR move. And what it also did was it began to instill hope. So much of African American history is about the fight for hope. And that's what you get out of the Emancipation Proclamation, not the policy itself. Because the policy itself basically said you're still enslaved. But that there was the hope of freedom afterwards. And this is, this is part of what you see mobilizing 
the enslaved who were like, yeah, we're hooking up a Grant's army. We're going to take you down. That's what you see there. But Lincoln, Lincoln always was, I don't see this great transformation. I see a very savvy politician. There we go. <laughs> so like, I know what you mean. I had the flu. I was out flat on my back basically all of February. <gasps> that thing was wicked. I mean, that thing felt like biological warfare. I was like, <laughs> whoa. And, and so I swear that the flu ate half my brain. There are times I'm like, mm. <laughs> Oh, I know what you mean. This is, mm. Another one. Yes. Yes. I'm going to hear how we move forward. You didn't really tell us. What can, well, <laughs> how do we, can we move forward? I guess I want to know yes. first, and then how do we do it? Yes. And so part of the, one of the things about the, the book White Rage is that what I saw prior to this is that a lot of the, the, the discussion about race in America felt polemical to me, felt anecdotal. You know, the one person who didn't get into Berkeley uh, the one white guy who didn't get into Berkeley, so affirmative action is bad. Mm? Um, the one white guy who didn't get the job as a fireman, so hmm. The, and, and, and we had people talking past each other without the facts. That's why white rage, I think about a third of the book, are footnotes. Because when we start talking from the facts, when we start talking from the evidence, I mean, and I find this with my students, when they're in, an, in, uh, in a discussion with someone and someone says something like, and my students go back with, and so you get, but to be able to say, no, no, that's not actually what happened. So, so one of the things that you get was, well, you know, I just don't understand. After the Civil Rights Movement, why black people haven't made more progress? I mean, there's no discrimination anymore. So huh, if this feels like a cultural issue, that, you know, not wanting to work hard, expecting the government to give you everything. Has anybody heard that argument? OK. <laughs> um, and, and so to be able to talk about what I start documenting in here is exactly what happened policy-wise after the civil rights movement, how those incredible gains were transformed linguistically and policy-wise to give us the basis to have the conversation. That's the first piece. To me, the second piece in looking at this is that this is a conversation overwhelmingly that whites have to have with whites. Because a lot of this white rage that I'm talking about is in fact fueled by a framing of a zero sum game. That if blacks get, it can only be at white's expense. If, and, 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 and understand that the framing of white rage is also applicable to people who don't know their place. If Latinos get, it can only be. In that framing of zero sum game, it's a false framing. It is a framing that is designed to pit us against each other. It is a framing that is designed to instill fear and to have policies based on fear of loss. For instance, the war on drugs. We spent $1 trillion. Could you imagine what we could have with $1 trillion dollars if we weren't so afraid of what black people voting would mean? If we weren't so afraid of what quality education for all really meant? We would be in a very different place. And so part of how we have to get out of this. So is whites having the conversation with whites and real conversations? We all have crazy Uncle Joes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and and so I look, you know, so one of the things I hear is, for instance, well, you know, you say that there's this, this kind of racism that's going on, but Barack Obama got elected twice. Okay, I'm going to say it again. How many times have we heard that one? Okay. In neither of those elections did the majority of whites vote for Barack Obama. 
that's part of what gets missed in that, yeah, but he got elected twice. And so what happens is if you have voter suppression that goes after blacks, Latinos, Asian Americans, and the poor, you get the majority of whites voting for Donald Trump. The majority who voted voted for Donald Trump. The majority of everybody else did not. These are conversations that whites have to have with whites about the kind of nation we want to live in. And to understand that what is at stake means that we could have a much more vibrant nation. It's not a loss, it's a gain. But it means holding on to white rage, requiring policies that systematically undermine this nation is the road to doom. And those are hard conversations. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Don't, yeah, you're like, yeah, I got crazy Uncle Joe. Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, yeah. Isn't it bad? Yeah. And then you hear something crazy, and you're just sitting there like, OK, if I take the turkey out of my mouth. <laughs> right? It is so hard. But we have to get there. We have to get there, because being silent. So down in the, the, the race in Alabama, Roy Moore. <laughs> I'm, like like church, right? <laughs> well, 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 well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is in Alabama where you have a man who is absolutely wholly unqualified to be in any position of power. The majority of whites in Alabama who voted, voted for Roy Moore. Because what he offered them was white supremacy. That's why we have to have this conversation. One more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Firstly, this was fabulous. So oh, thank, thank you, you for coming. Um, I really liked your point about false framing. And so obviously, you know, the way we construct history is in many ways like a national project. And so when we see kind of this isn't new, but like Southern textbooks, for example, mm -hmm. right? So like, what are we telling our babies about history and about us? Um, and so when we see like Southern textbooks, social studies textbooks, history textbooks saying things like the Civil War is a, you know, a Northern War of Aggression or the Native Americans just got tired and decided they were gonna leave um, <laughs> and how that works. Or there was no one there to begin with. Yeah, so how do we fit this into the frame of white rage, right? So for me, I see that as a blatant, uh, explicit act of white rage, um, but it's something that has been naturalized. So how do we kind of undo those? Yeah, I mean, so like, you know, one of the, the big battle right now is in Texas, because Texas is such a huge market that the textbooks in Texas determine what the textbooks throughout the nation are. Be afraid. Be very afraid. So Texas wants in its textbooks um, that the enslaved really weren't slaves, they were workers, just immigrant workers. And that, you know, there really weren't Mexicans in Texas. <laughs> I'm telling you, right? Right? And so, but what this does then, when you erase people out of the narrative, and think about it this way too. I think it's about only 20% of Americans have a bachelor's degree so that the history that most get are in K through 12. And if K through 12 is telling you that either the slaves were happy or they were just workers and that there were no Mexicans and so only whites built America, then that's the narrative that most folks have. Wow and understand that the choosing of textbooks, and this is why in the framing of white rage, because that's why we get so focused in like on Charlottesville and the Klan. But the stuff that I'm talking about did not happen with the cross burning. It happened in school board meetings where they're choosing textbooks. It happened in uh, Congress where they're figuring out 
how the Federal Housing Act will work. Who's going to get loans and who's not? None of this is done with a cross burning and folks in sheets. City council meetings. Yeah. And so that's how this fits into the frame of white rage. The control of the narrative is so powerful in America. So it's like, you know, that's why part of when I know it sounded so when I was like, you know, the police are here to protect and serve. You know, if you keep your nose clean and work hard, you too can have the American dream. I mean, this is part of the hymnal that we sing from that we don't even need the book anymore because we know the song. Once you have that inculcated into the population, boom, you're good. So if you've got a narrative there that nobody built America but whites. And so I've had, my inbox is like, ooh, mmm, ooh. <laughs> and I hear, whites built America and you people you people are trying to take it from us and that's why we're taking our country back. And I'm like, I, I never respond, but I'm thinking, so how's that working for you right now? <laughs> right? Um, I had another guy write to me saying, you know, Dr. Vervoort in South Africa had it right. We need to have a Bantu stand policy to lock you Negro criminals up away from us. When you have a narrative that this is a white nation and whites only built America, then you get these kinds of policies that are also based on, and this is also what's really hard about having these conversations, thank you, is that another component of this is the issue of merit. How hard you have worked to get where you are. And we know we're all working hard. You don't get to the University of Michigan by not working hard. I know that's right. I know that's right, right? And, and so when you have then another narrative that's coming through going, yes, but you need to recognize that 80% of the nation's GNP in 1865 was based on slavery. Ooh. OK, maybe we didn't quite all build this. Build this. Maybe this, there's some other folk in here. Or that the railroad system, the Chinese immigrants who were brought here to work in those in untenable conditions, helped build the, the, the lines that made the commerce possible. When you start really doing that, and then you begin to see the kind of skewed access to resources, then that narrative of merit begins to shake and wobble. And so much of who we are is based on, we worked hard for this. We earned this. And that's why those conversations are also really hard, because you're, it feels like you're attacking somebody's foundational sense of self and identity. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure there are many more questions, <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid we have to close. So please join me in thanking the first